one of my least favorite things about this book, besides Jameson, I, Jameson's gonna be like my new Will Herondale. Like, I'm just gonna complain about him all the time. Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with another exciting video collab. Um, I will link the playlist down below. The first one we did was about reading the Goodreads winners for the last 10 years in various categories, and this time it is also awards, but we actually are picking different awards that are connected in some way to our category. So basically I picked three different children's book awards. Um, this can include middle grade or young adult books, and I wanted to specifically focus on ones that are a little more niche, like I didn't want to pick the Newbery for example, um, and I kind of wanted to, you know, get a sample and see if, as we all would probably predict, if these awards are better at choosing uh, excellent kid lit books than Goodreads is. <laughs> so I'm gonna give a very brief description of each of the three awards and go over the books that I will be reading for it. Um, I, I went with the nominations or like finalists or whatever that were chosen for um, the most recent year of the of the award. Just whatever was available at the time I started putting this list together. Um, and also one of the awards I'll get to, I have quite a few picks, but I actually did have to narrow it down. Um, Okay, so the Schneider Family Book Award is to honor an author or illustrator for a book that embodies an artistic expression of the disability experience for child and adolescent audiences. I won't be putting up covers of the books because you'll see those as we go through the video, um, but I'll be reading Breathe and Come Back from Ten by Natalia Sylvester, In the Blue by Aaron Horrigan, The Words We Keep by Aaron Stewart, Honestly Elliot by Jillian McDunn, Listen by Shannon Stalker, Wild Oak by C.C. Harrington, and Hummingbird by Natalie Lloyd. Then, the Kirkus Prize for Young Readers. These books are chosen or nominated by a panel of judges who are familiar with Kid Lit. Um, I'll be reading The Troubled Girls of Dragomir Academy by Anne Ursu, Himawari House by Harmony Becker, Coffee, Rabbit, Snowdrop, Lost by Bettina Burkier, The Year We Learned to Fly by Jacqueline Woodson, How You Grow Wings by Rima Onoseta, and The Golden Hour by Nikki Smith. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is the Kids Book Choice Awards, which are the only National Book Awards chosen solely by kids and teens, which I think is very, very cool, and that's another reason why I wanted to get a pretty big sample from this award. And there's a ton of different categories, so I kind of just went through and picked some of the categories that I thought would be most interesting or most useful um, or just looked most exciting. So between books that I had actually already read from this list um, before reading what the nominees were and then the books that I would be reading for this vlog, I wanted to have read at least, um, I think it was like around three books for each of the categories that I picked. Um, and also I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Watercress by Andrea Wong, The 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones, Playing the Cards Are Dealt by Varian Johnson, and Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully. These are all books that I had read previously before doing this project. They're not all the books I had already read, but these are some of my favorites, so just wanted to really recommend those. But the books that I will be reading during the vlog are The Beatrice Prophecy by Kate DiCamillo, A Sitting in St. James by Rita Williams Garcia, The Las Quintista by Dona Barba Higuera, Call Me Athena by Colby Cedar Smith, Big Brain Book by Leanne Boucher Gill, Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe, Himawari House by Harmony Becker was nominated for this award as well, Legacy by Nikki Grimes, The Magical and Perfect by Chris Barron, The Hawthorne Legacy by Jennifer Lynn Barnes, actually it's the second book that was nominated so I'll be reading the first and second, We All Play by Julie Flett, Nina by Tracy N. Todd, Fallout by Steve Scheinkin, Timelines from Black History by DK Books, One Be Too Many by Andre P. Andrew, This Book is Feminist by Jamie O. Wilson, and Unspeakable by Carol Boston Weatherford. Obviously that's a lot of books, so this is going to be a long video, um, although some of these are like picture books or books that I won't have um, as much to review. Um, but still, get comfy, maybe get a snack, something to drink, maybe use this as a crafting sprint, I don't know. And as always, I will list content warnings um, in the description box for the books that I read, um, and also any links that I mention. And of course that includes the playlist of this video and everybody else participating. And of course I am also going to include the uh, book awards that I actually chose so that you can read more about them, because um, I think they're doing some really wonderful work. So let's get into the actual vlog. Okay friends, so I have finished the first book. I read Honestly Elliot by Jillian McDunn, and I absolutely loved this. Um, so our main character is Elliot, and he has ADHD. The way he describes it is that like he actually has like a lot of attention, it's just that he doesn't always know which things to pay attention to, like which things are important or that other people um, consider important for his attention. Um, but one of the things that he really thrives with is cooking. That's one of the things where um, like having your attention in a lot of different places at once is actually really valuable. Um, and it's something that he loves doing. I really loved all of the food descriptions here. Elliot is struggling a little bit after like an incident um, involving his family um, and also 
just there's a lot of changes for him going on right now. His best friend moved away recently, um, so he doesn't feel like he really has any close friends anymore. Um, school can be very difficult and stressful for him, and also uh, there's a lot going on in his family. Like, his parents are divorced, and his father has remarried um, to a woman named Kate, and Elliot likes her, and they actually start getting closer throughout the book, which I really love, um, but it's also hard on him because they're expecting a baby, and Elliot feels like he's being replaced, so he's dealing with a lot. I really love Elliot as a character and um, he's got a very strong voice, like the narrative voice of this book is fantastic um, and a big part of it, like I said, involves cooking. Um, he ends up getting uh, paired up with a girl named Maribel for a project and Maribel is like very popular and very like high achieving. She always does great in school and she's very organized. I really really loved their friendship and seeing them work on this project. Maribel also has celiac disease and I really loved seeing that talked about in this book. Um, she talks about how hard it is as a kid to not be able to just eat what you want, um, not be able to have a lot of the foods that you know other kids are having and she also talks about like how much it sucks that it's, that like eating gluten-free has become like a trend or a joke or a way, a way to say that somebody is like picky or a snob when it's like actually dangerous for her to be near gluten like even like even um if somebody is baking with regular flour around her that can be dangerous for her i really loved how many different things that this book included or dealt with in a way that didn't feel rushed or overdone. Like, of course, we have Elliot and what it's like to have ADHD and how that, like, affects the way that he does things and sees the world and how frustrating it can be when it feels like people don't believe him about things or they don't believe him about things. They don't believe that he's trying or that um, certain things are difficult for him that are really easy for others and that kind of thing. And I especially love the kind of, like, metaphors or comparisons that Elliot would use to describe um, what having ADHD is like for him. We have, like, themes about friendships and, um, like, different kinds of friends or how hard it is to make new friends and, like, connecting with people. Um, we have, like, themes about family and, like, how everyone's family looks different and how you can't ever tell what somebody's life is like from the outside. And then we also have some, like, cool, like, local history elements, um, connected to their project. And I also really love how, um, Elliot has to kind of uh, like, re-examine some of his own, like, prejudices and, like, beliefs, um, because he really looks up to this, like, one chef. There's also some great positive representation of therapy here. Um, I also just really enjoyed seeing all of the different characters and their relationships and how nuanced those were. Something I really love is that we see that Elliot is actually really great with some kinds of details. Um, like, he's incredibly good at, like, noticing things that people like and dislike, and, like, he looks out for people. There's a lot of parts of the book and Elliot's character that really push back on, like, the flattening of, like, people who have neurodivergence, and I think that is just really, really cool. So, yeah, I obviously love this one. I gave, honestly, Elliot five stars. I am really glad to start off this project with a big hit. Hello everyone, I have finished another book and that is Hummingbird by Natalie Lloyd and you guys, I am so happy that I'm doing this project because um, I loved this one as well and this is clearly going much better than the other two collabs I've participated in, um, like for all of us really. So in Hummingbird we are following our main character Olive and she has osteogenesis imperfecta which um, the author is writing based on her own experiences. Osteogenesis imperfecta is also known as brittle bone disease. Um, so Olive's bones break very easily, she has to be extremely careful, um, often she uses a wheelchair, and for a long time now she has been dreaming of going to a middle school in her town because um, she's been homeschooled for a long time and even though she loved it she really really wants to have this um, you know, experience as well, and a big reason is that she wants to make a best friend. She just feels like she has a best friend waiting for her, so her parents are understandably, you know, they're they're worried about her and they try to protect her, um, but Olive is trying to make them see that protecting her doesn't mean that she can't do new things, and it doesn't mean that she's not strong. And her parents finally agree, and so we see Olive um, start to get used to this completely different environment. We see her making friends. Um, she also really wants to audition for a part in the play um, that is based on the life of Emily Dickinson, and Olive is so excited, and she knows that she could be uh, she knows she could be one of the leads, um, but it seems like the theater teacher is maybe 
like she wants to include Olive but she's not listening to what Olive wants um, and so she's struggling with that and then um, there is this legend of a hummingbird in her village or in her town um, that like when there is a blue moon that happens on May Day then a magical hummingbird will arrive um, and it will grant one person a wish if they like um, solve this riddle and everything. And so even though Olive has been really, you know, confident and very secure in herself for a long time, um, she starts wondering about, you know, maybe she could use this wish for the hummingbird um, so that she could have solid bones, you know, like um, normal bones, and her family wouldn't have to worry about her so much and people would believe her when they say when she says she can do things and she wouldn't get called fragile so much. But of course a lot of other people are also wanting to find the hummingbird and make a wish. I love this book. Um, I just thought it was absolutely beautiful and I really feel like it shows that disability and like people's perspectives on it is for one thing very unique of course um, but also that it's not an all-or-nothing thing. Um, you know it's not like it's not like Olive is 100% confident or 0% confident, you know? And speaking of Olive, I absolutely adored her. She might be one of my favorite main characters I've read recently because she is just so warm and bright and kind. Like, she just has such an incredibly big heart and I adored her and I loved following her. I loved her her compassion and her humor and her determination and her desire to prove to people that that she is, you know, strong the way she is. And I really loved the support network she had. Um, like, just the family relationships in general were so well done. And I also really loved the friendships. I adored Grace, who is um, Olive's, like, new best friend. Um, and I also really loved Hatch, who is Olive's stepbrother, um, who they, they've barely interacted up to this point. They kind of have each thought that the other one didn't like them. Um, and so they finally kind of start seeing each other more as siblings and like getting to hang out and talk to each other and it's just really really lovely. Like all of the characterization I thought was done so well. I also really loved the writing. Um, this isn't first person from Olive's perspective and I feel like first person is not always my favorite, um, which I, I guess is like somewhat an unpopular opinion, but I think it was such so much the right choice for this book because like Olive's personality just shown through the writing because um, like all of it was very bright and warm and friendly um and it just it was really really beautiful as well there were some really just beautiful lines and ideas that to me didn't feel like over explained or you know sappy or anything um and i also think that the writing and all those character like all of this worked in so well with the interesting kind of genre that this book is because i would say it's mostly a contemporary but then there's like a little bit of fantasy um with like the hummingbird and some of the other like mysterious and magical things that have happened in their town and that everyone kind of more or less knows about and accepts and i also really liked how the plot played out like kind of the two main pieces which were the play and the hummingbird i just absolutely love this book um i obviously gave hummingbird five stars once again, I am so excited I'm doing this project. We are off to a fantastic start. <laughs> Hello everybody, I am back. I did finish another book. This is a picture book, Listen, How Evelyn Glennie, A Deaf Girl, Changed Percussion by Shannon Stalker, illustrated by Devin Holtzworth. Um, this is a beautifully illustrated book um, and it's a nonfiction and kind of a picture book biography of Evelyn Glennie, who is a percussionist um, who became deaf. She was I think around like middle school age maybe and she um got progressively more hard of hearing it's about how she like broke all these barriers and she became this incredible musician and even though people were constantly like well how can you like how can you audition for this academy how can you perform in this concert when you're deaf and she kept doing it anyway it talks about like the way that she like felt the vibrations of the music um and one thing that i love about the illustrations in addition to just being really beautiful is i feel like it is such a cool representation, like a visual representation of sound and vibrations. I don't think I had heard of Evelyn Glennie before, um, and so I, I'm really glad that I know about her now. I think I'm at maybe like a 4.5 stars. I, I have like a little bit of a reservation about the way that like hearing aids, for example, are kind of like talked about very briefly in the book. Um, so Evelyn Glennie ends up like not using them like and actually to this day she decides she decides she doesn't want to use hearing aids at all also i'm not deaf or hard of hearing myself so take all of this with a big pinch of salt um but i feel like for a book that is intended especially for young readers and that might possibly be picked up by kids who are deaf or hard of hearing or who know someone who is or who maybe just hadn't 
like didn't know about this before um i think it would have been nice to have just even a passing reference maybe in the story or in the author's note i just feel like like kids should know that it's okay if they do want to use those kinds of like resources and everything hello again everybody in the blue by aaron hurrigan this is a picture book about um a young girl or it's from the perspective of a young girl whose father is dealing with depression and the way that their family all kind of learns about that and comes together to support him in the best way possible and it's got a positive message about seeking help um you know counseling or therapy and also for um the other members of the family too to kind of navigate this with him um and it also acknowledges that you know the depression is not going to just magically get fixed and go away it's going to be something that ebbs and flows like the ocean um and that they'll get through it together. And I just, I thought this was a really beautiful and wonderful picture book. Let me show you. Like, I think the use of color was just really, really well done and very thoughtful, very intentional. Um, yeah, I give this five stars. I think it's a fantastic picture book and I think it does a really great job of covering a lot of the nuances of these kinds of mental health, um, like things that can affect families. I also read The Words We Keep by Erin Stewart. Um, this is a contemporary. We are following our main character, Lily Larkin, whose sister Alice ha is just coming back from um, a kind of like rehabilitation program um, because she has she self was self-harming as a result of her bipolar disorder and um, Lily is actually the one who found her um, after something very, very uh, severe like happened. Um, and so that's obviously she's dealing with a lot in terms of that but also her own mental health she's got a lot of pressure on her um even from people or situations that don't realize that they're putting this pressure on her um and also internalized pressure about like having to you know be the best and having to get like a perfect grade on this project and getting into the perfect school and all of that um i think the stress of like junior year and everything that was communicated really really well very effectively um and she also has the worry of kind of like she doesn't get to have any kind of weakness because of um what what her older sister is going through um and she ends up meeting this boy named micah um he's her partner on a project where they're going to be using art and poetry together lily is the poet and micah is like the visual artist and of course they don't get along immediately um but gradually they have a real connection with each other and that turns into something romantic and we also learn more about micah's past um or not not past necessarily but like some things about like his family and also like what micah is going through and struggling with because he was actually at the same um center that alice was and specifically i think lily has um ocd and an anxiety disorder um and i also want to mention i'm sure i've mentioned this earlier in the video but um please check content warnings for these books if you need to this one in particular has a lot and not necessarily ones that you would expect from the premise and this is going to be a really hard book to review because i recognize its value but i have mixed feelings about the execution obviously a lot of people have found um like a lot of resonance in this book and um it it obviously has i think helped some people which is great in terms of the characters i really felt for lily for what she was going through um, and like I said, I connected with some aspects of what she was going through and like the kinds of stress and I also I feel like um, One of the things that this book did very well with regards to Lily is like the difficulty of Like feeling like you can't mess up or you can't break you can't ask for help because somebody else already has the complicated relationship that she has with her older sister Alice um, I think that was also communicated very well, but I think there were aspects of the way this book was written that made it harder for Lily to feel like a complete character, if that makes sense. Um, and then as for Micah, for some reason I had assumed that this was going to be dual perspective, but it's not. We're in Lily's point of view the whole time, and <laughs> I'll be honest, like Micah felt more than a little bit like a manic pixie dream boy <laughs> for like a good chunk of this book. Um, I do think that that got better later, and I feel like that was partly the point, you know, um, the way that like Lily was kind of making assumptions about like how he was doing and things like that. So I do, I do get that. But I also, that's one of the other things where it's like, I feel like his character could have been more well-rounded earlier in the book. And I think that would have strengthened the book. I did end up liking the romantic element more than I thought I would at the beginning. It's interesting because a couple of times, Lily and Micah kind of are like, are we maybe bad for each other? Which for one thing, I feel like that's not something that you should 
I don't know, brush off lightly. But for another thing, I don't actually think they are. So I thought that was a little odd that that was in there. And also, I was a little worried from the way things were described in the synopsis that it would kind of suggest that romantic love is kind of can, what can make somebody start healing or something like that. Um, and it actually isn't, and that is kind of called out by the book. I also really liked some of the side characters. Um, I really liked Margot, who is the younger sister of Alice and Lily. Um, I liked their dad, I liked their stepmother, and I also liked Sam, um, who is our main character's best friend. And also I like that there was an emphasis on like lots of different kinds of love. With the writing, um, I actually did like the poetry sections. I feel like a lot of times those don't work so well for me. You know, in books where you're told that the main the main character is like this amazing poetry writer and then you read the poems and you're like, hmm. <laughs> um, so I actually, I did like these. Um, but the writing of the rest of it, I struggled with because I didn't feel like we often got to see like the order of events or like the process of what was happening or like the decision making of the character. And obviously I'm not saying like this book is bad because this character who's suffering from mental illness did not make good decisions. I don't have to agree with a character's decisions. I just want to understand why they're making them and I have read books that deal with, um, I don't know, similar kinds of like mental health issues or discussions in ways that still were I don't know, like narratively effective. Do you know what I mean? Hello everyone. So I, I wanted to add on, add some things about the words we keep. So if you are somebody who never looks at content warnings, you never feel like you need them or they would benefit you, feel free to skip this little segment here. So the big one that I want to mention specifically is that there is an on-page suicide attempt by the main character and it's kind of, it's not quite as clear-cut as those sometimes those scenes sometimes are. It's a first-person narration from the main character and it can be very upsetting obviously to like have that kind of content especially in such an immediate like narrative style. I have some kind of questions about the way it was handled, the way that it was included in the story and that's also the other thing that I wanted to mention. One of the things that kept me from like you know wholeheartedly recommending this one is I don't necessarily think that all of the big topics that it brings up are given the kind of care and attention that they need. Um, like just as an example, one of the characters at one point starts taking like mental illness medication that they are not, they are not the one who it was prescribed for. Um, they start taking that and combining it with sleeping pills, which is incredibly dangerous. Um, like just mixing medications in general is dangerous. Taking things that were not prescribed for you is dangerous. Like all of this is bad enough, but like the fact that it's mixed with sleeping pills as well, like I don't think that was, like we do eventually hear in the story about like, oh, you shouldn't do that, that's bad. The character ends up um, needing medical attention for like other things as well. So like that does, it is sort of dealt with, but in a very, Kind of oblique way like I just that's one of the examples of the things that this book like brings up but I don't think it really deals with them and not to say that like you need to make it like the main point of the story or have like a whole like story arc around it or come to some kind of conclusion or whatever but like you know there are ways to include elements in a way that is thoughtful and respectful and gives them the seriousness that they need. I am glad that this book seems to really be connecting with um, other readers and um, there's clearly a lot of other people who really love it. I just had some issues with it. Hello everybody, I have finally finished another book. I feel like I say that in every update, uh, but I just finished Breathe and Count Back from 10 by Natalia Sylvester. Our main character is named Veronica and um, she has hip dysplasia and she really, really loves swimming. It's physical therapy for her, but it's also just the place where she feels most whole and most happy. Um, and she has been dreaming of being one of these performing um, like swimmers or like like actors, um, they perform as mermaids in this like theme park near where she lives and that has been like her dream for so long but her parents haven't wanted her to because they feel it's inappropriate but when Veronica finds out that they're having auditions to replace somebody um, she decides that she's going to try, that she wants this chance um, but she also finds out that her parents have been keeping some information from her about um, about her hip dysplasia and exactly what is going on. I really liked Veronica. I also thought that themes came through really well in this book. Um, this book deals a lot with bodily autonomy, um, specifically in terms of like physical intimacy, but also with um, like health, like healthcare and making your own decisions about that and how um, 
like how Veronica is trying to navigate that um, when her parents are still trying to like make those decisions for her because they think that they can protect her better. I feel like her parents, especially her mom, I thought was a much more interesting and complex character um, than you sometimes find in stories like this and like I would have liked to see more of that from her dad as well. We get a little bit more of that near the end. The book does a good job of showing how people can people can hurt those they love even when they are doing things because they love them. And I also really liked some of the other side characters, um, including Danny, who is Veronica's sister, um, and also her friend Leslie, because, um, like, I feel like Leslie's character type is one that is, like, pretty common as, like, a best friend, but I feel like it was written a lot more enjoyably, in my opinion. And then also story-wise, I just really liked the plot progression in this, and I really, really loved um, the actual mermaid performances and um, just, like, the way that was part of the story and the way that we really got a feeling for um, what this meant to our main character. I just thought that was really, really beautiful. There is also a romantic subplot in this book, and that is part of the like themes around like making um like making your own decisions and everything and um I did really like Alex as a character like as a person he is just such a sweetheart and I like I, I found him very likable I just think in terms of the story I didn't really care that much about their romance certain conversations this book is having I think can be kind of complicated when you're talking about um minors and I think for the most part the book did like a pretty good job of navigating that. I know people have like different feelings on how that's done. Really enjoyed this and I'm giving Breathing Count back from 10, like four or four and a half stars, somewhere around there. Um, I thought it was very well done. Hello everybody, I have finished the last book for the Schneider Book Award. So I did finish Wild Oak by C.C. Harrington. Um, this is one that I actually listened to on audio. Um, Camilla O'Grady is the narrator and I thought she did an absolutely beautiful job. So we're following a young girl named Maggie Stevens um, and she has a stutter and it's something that she's been struggling with for a while now. Um, school can be really hard for her and also her home life. Like, um, her mom is incredibly loving and supportive and her dad really loves her as well, but he is not nearly as understanding of what Maggie, like, what her needs are and, like, the things that she does differently and that that's okay. Um, he kind of sees it as like a problem that they, that they need to fix. And then our other one um, is we are following one of these two snow leopard cubs um, and his name is, let me check, Rumpus. And so he and his sister are these two snow leopard cubs and they actually get separated um, like pretty much at the beginning of the story. So we're only following Rumpus, we're not following his sister really. Um, and this is historical fiction. It is set in what year? Um, 1963. So this is set at a period where um, the like exotic pets market was like a really big thing. Um, this is set in the UK um, and I think in like a lot of different countries this was a time period where that was just something that you could do. Like, you could buy, like, a snow leopard as a pet. Um, and there weren't a lot of, like, regulations preventing that at this time. And that's basically what ends up happening to Rumpus, um, is that he gets bought by this wealthy woman who has no idea what she's getting into. And he ends up destroying her flat because, like, he's a wild animal. <laughs> um, and she gets really upset. And so she, um, has somebody basically, like, dump him in the forest in Wales. Um, because she thinks like, oh, he can just, you know, figure it out himself, which like, domesticated animals can't do that. You can't do that. Um, but thankfully, Rumpus does end up getting found by Maggie. And the reason Maggie's in Wales is that she is staying with her grandfather. Her and her mom think that this could be really good for her. And her father's wanting to send her to like a school or like a treatment center specifically for children with disabilities or um, like anything kind of like that. And Maggie has heard really horrible things about it and her mom has too. They really don't want her to go there, but her dad isn't really listening. He says, no, no, those are just rumors. This will be really good for you. And so like Maggie going to stay with her grandfather is kind of her last chance to like fix her stutter um, without going to this horrible place. And she ends up coming across Rumpus in the woods and very slowly kind of gets him to trust her. She ends up helping him um, um, like he, he gets his, his paw caught in a really horrible trap and so um, she is kind of there to like take care of him and do the best she can. This is one that I did have on my TBR originally but I think maybe, I don't know, it's like plot wise it's not necessarily my thing because even though I love animals I don't necessarily like this kind of story. I think it is important that kids kind of are introduced to that. I really loved Maggie as a main character. She is, she has such a, a 
beautiful warm heart and she is such a gentle and caring person and I felt for her um, I just felt for her so much and I wanted people to listen to her I wanted her to feel more confident in herself and so seeing her journey was really really lovely um, I also loved her grandfather I also loved her mother and I also think that the characterization of her father was actually done very well like even though it was kind of a quick decision for some of it I think it actually made sense I really really loved Camila O'Grady's narration I mentioned that at the beginning but um, I think she did a beautiful job of incorporating Maggie's speech patterns in a way that felt very natural and like it didn't at all feel like exaggerated I also think the themes of the story um, were very important and were done very well and I just really like was rooting for Maggie and for Rumpus um, and there were some really really lovely moments between them I also like the choice to write from Rumpus's perspective in a way that both is and isn't like filtered through his perspective as an animal I gave Wild Oak four stars Next I have one where this is actually on two different lists, so clearly this was very well thought of. Um, and this is a graphic novel called Himawari House by Harmony Becker. I'll show a little example of the art, which I absolutely loved. Um, and we are following, let me check on character names here. Um, our main character is Nao and she has, um, she's Japanese, Japanese American. Um, and it's been a long time since she's been to Japan. I believe she actually was born there and she spent like the early part of her life there. Um, but her family did end up moving to the US and now, um, after uh, graduating high school, now is kind of taking a year off to um, go back to Japan and try and kind of reconnect with her roots and with her background. Um, and not so much with like family there, she actually ends up getting um, sort of like a, a roommate situation with um, a few other like students. Um, and they're all kind of preparing for exams, preparing to enter different like colleges or like, you know, training programs and things like that. Um, and so she ends up rooming with these two other girls, one of whom is from Singapore um, and the other is South Korean. And I absolutely loved this. I thought the humor was communicated so well. Um, I really, really loved the way that um, Harmony Becker like portrayed like language now actually doesn't speak as fluent Japanese as she used to and so she's kind of struggling to pick it up again and um, I think that the way that we're shown when she like misses words or um, the way that Harmony Becker wrote out accents like there's like a note at the back where she talks about like the portrayal of Asian accents in Western media and how they're always like comical and like ridiculous and like offensive um, and so she wanted to show that like accent like all accents are beautiful and that having an accent is not a bad thing and that it doesn't make you um like less smart and i really love that and i really like the way that um she did that in the text as well i loved all three of these girls so so much i loved their friendship i loved them individually i was actually really surprised that we did end up following um let me check character names again um hai jung and tina um i was really surprised that we sort of got like perspectives from them almost um but i'm glad we did that we got to know more about them and their family and what they're dealing with and why they ended up here um there's also a little bit of a romance subplot that i absolutely loved um between now and like one of the guys at um who's in like their kind of house situation i just thought this said so many wonderful things about like family but also found family and friendships and culture and language um and like acceptance i just thought it was really really beautiful i love that we see the characters like exchange like information and knowledge about like um the si similarities but also differences between being japanese or chinese or uh from singapore or from south korea like i just thought that was so cool the one tiny thing that i didn't love is specific to the ending all i will say is that i think the note that it ends on we're supposed to feel we're supposed to feel satisfied well, like there are circumstances where i actually don't agree with the idea that like things don't have to be permanent to have meaning like in some cases yes but in some cases no so that's all i'm gonna say but i did still love this i still gave it five stars hello everybody i have two picture books to update you on because i just read them um please enjoy whatever <laughs> whatever my update was doing. So the first one I finished was Coffee Rabbit Snowdrop Lost by Bettina Burkier, illustrated by Anna Marguerite Kiergaard, and translated by Shanid Kirka Konkerskoff. And the book actually ends up dealing with um, with dementia and um, what's what that's like for this young girl and like what it means for their family and the things that they can do together. And when I realized what it is about, 
it just really um it really hit me emotionally i think it was really well done i think it's a great i think it could be a really good like teaching tool for young kids dealing with um adults in their life who have uh, memory issues like this i don't think i had ever like come across this perspective before the goal is not to correct them and to get them to remember things right the goal is connection so like if they are mixing up stories and memories like the value of the interactions is not in its accuracy it's just in the ability to connect and to like care for each other and to relate to them and to find like common ground that you can still talk about um and i just thought that's a really important message that again i hadn't come across before so i kind of like i feel like i'm at like a four and a half stars for this but this one and the other picture book i'm going to talk about like i gave them both four and a half stars but it could be a five star with time you know as it kind of settles more the other picture book i just read is the year we learned to fly by jacqueline woodson illustrated by rafael lopez so i love jacqueline woodson these main kids um they are really bored inside because the weather's really bad and so they can't go out and play and their grandmother tells them to um like imagine that they can fly and kind of like what that like basically it's, it's like about imagination and so the beginning i was like oh okay like i get it that's very cool and then as we go on you realize that it's about that but it's also about more um and specifically that jacqueline woodson wrote this as a love letter to Virginia Hamilton and the people could fly this other very well-known work this is another like four and a half stars but it might be a five stars later so I just finished the troubled girls of Dragomir Academy by Anne Ursu um, this is a fantasy novel we are following our main character Maria and in this world um, only boys have the ability to use magic um, they become sorcerers Maria has grown up hearing that her brother Luca is like destined to be this great sorcerer that he's um amazingly talented and he's so special and important and everyone has all these big expectations for him and nobody has ever expected like anything from Maria like they have really low expectations of her um including her own family and then on the day that Luca is getting his kind of test to see if he has magic um everything goes wrong and Maria is blamed for it and so um as a result of that, she gets a letter that she has to attend the Dragomir Academy for Troubled Girls, uh, and it's mandatory. She does not get a choice about this. And we see her start to slowly make friends and allies with the other girls, um, and also start to uncover some things about the history of this school. This ended up being a surprise for me because I thought I knew what, like, the setup was going to be, where things were going, and I, like, it didn't go the direction I thought, and even after that, when I did start figuring pieces of it out, I think the way that Anne Ursu revealed it was really well done. Like, I really appreciate when books can do kind of reveals or, like, uncovering information in a way that is interesting enough that even if you kind of see where things are going, then you can still enjoy it. The letters and where those relationships went, I just thought was really beautiful, and I really loved that. I also really loved the female friendships here. Um, like, of course, some of the girls get along better than others, but overall, one of the main things about this book is that it's about these girls, like, standing up for each other and coming together. And I thought, like, the kind of mystery aspect was really, really interesting. Like, I was consistently engaged in that part. Um, I like that there's a little bit of, like, weaving and discussion of tapestries. Um, I thought that thematically this book was great, like, the way that it talks about, um, like, history and truth and like asking questions like i thought that was really really excellent and i really loved the ending of this book i thought it was beautiful i love um kind of the ideas that we end the book with i think that was fantastic so um i ended up really enjoying this one even though it did have a bit of a slow start for me like slow not just in terms of like the story kind of developing but also my engagement and investment in it i gave the troubled girls of dragomir academy four stars it's really cool to see middle grade fantasy that is so so like strongly feminist um i just thought that was really well done here so yeah really enjoyed this one i also finished a graphic novel the golden hour by nikki smith i'm not gonna hold this up really because it's a library book and it's very shiny um but i'll just show you very briefly some of the art style which is this really lovely beautifully warm color palette we're following manuel as our main character and we know from pretty early on in the book that 
um, something very traumatic happened to him that he is suffering from PTSD um, related to an attack where um, he was in a classroom with a teacher and um, we find out a little bit more about that as the book goes on and Manuel is understandably really struggling with that but he is going to therapy and one of the things that his therapist has told him is finding anchors um, and so the way that he's been doing that is using his phone camera and taking photos but also just using the focus of the camera to focus himself as well um, and so he's getting more into photography there's a lot of like emphasis on this friendship with him and these two other kids at school um, they're getting ready for the 4-H fair I should mention that this is set in uh, small town Kansas I really really felt for Manuel and I think that the art and the storytelling conveyed his emotional state and what he was going through so well like we see him dealing with triggers and um, you know having panic attacks and trying to, to navigate those um, and we also see him get a lot of love and support from the people in his life sometimes people don't understand what he's trying to tell them but for the most part I really like that he has people he can rely on and that he's kind of realizing that um, I thought the friendships were lovely there's also a little bit of a like a hint of a possible crush and I thought that was handled very well and with a very light hand I thought the art style and like the photography the use of photography was really really beautiful like I feel like this book is one of those where um, it balances a feeling of like warmth and comfort almost but also tackling these really um, really big issues and big ideas so I thought this was great as well and I gave the golden hour five stars I did actually DNF a book for this project or I kind of like removed it from my list and that is how we grow wings um, I don't remember the author but I will put that in captions and this is not because it was a bad book or anything um, this is one that I I read the synopsis and I was like ooh, <laughs> I don't think I would have picked this up by myself um, and not in the more positive way that like some of these books have been but I did read the first like chapter or so um, the writing was good but I just really I don't think I was feeling ready for this kind of story um, it's set in Nigeria and it deals with two sisters who end up with very different paths in life um, and it's interesting because Homegoing by Yagyasi I have heard is very similar in that basic premise and that one I definitely do still want to read but for some reason the way that this one was done the way that the synopsis described everything as I've been discussing with some of these other books there are definitely some really really intense ones so I don't know I don't think I'm articulating very well why I took this one off the list but I'm not saying it's a bad book the writing is good the reviews are actually very very good but if I had kept going I really wouldn't have liked it and I don't think that would be fair to the book because again I I know that it wasn't for me like I wouldn't have tried to read it if it weren't for this project so I just finished The Beatrice Prophecy by Kate DiCamillo illustrated by Sophie Blackall and this is very short this is only about 250 pages and it is really beautifully illustrated and um, there's a lot of like illumination style illustrations as well which makes sense for the story like look at those so Beatrice of course is the one who a lot of the story is most obviously about um, she gets found by uh, a group of monks and Brother Edic in particular really wants to take care of her he was probably my favorite character he was just he's just such an incredibly good and loving person and like the way that he sees such beauty in the world I just really really adored it um, and he really is like looking out for Beatrice and he wants to like he wants them to take her in and take care of her and Beatrice at first doesn't remember who she is she doesn't remember anything about herself except her name and then eventually it comes out that it is very dangerous if she is found or if somebody is found to be helping her um, so she gets sent away but then brother Edic and this boy named Jack and um, this very mean goat named Answelica who basically bonded to Beatrice they all end up going after her to try and find her the writing is wonderful it's got like the perfect amount of like heart and humor and quirkiness I loved these characters again I said like I think brother brother Edic might be my favorite like he is just so wonderful and I just love the friendships and the way that the, this group of misfits kind of like take care of each other um, I love the themes of this book about love and storytelling it also went in some directions that I did not necessarily expect but I think 
I think it was done really well. I loved the last like chapter or so, the way everything came together. It felt perfect. There's so much of the plot that centers around Beatrice and also like all of the other characters kind of like being motivated by her that I sort of feel like her characterization to me didn't feel as well developed as with some of this, the other characters. Um, but that also might just be a me thing. But um, yeah, definitely a very pleasant surprise. I did really enjoy this. I gave the Beatrice Prophecy 4.5 stars. Hello everyone, Big Brain Book, How It Works and All Its Quirks by Leanne Boucher Gill, PhD. Um, so this is a children's nonfiction book and this is definitely not the kind of middle grade nonfiction I usually pick up, so I wouldn't have picked it up if it weren't for this project. Um, but I'm kind of glad that I did end up reading it. Like, science has never been, when I was in school, science was never one of my favorite subjects. But I actually found this really interesting and I learned some like very fun facts from this. <laughs> like, there were multiple uh sections like things in this book that i learned that i was like telling people it's like did you know this this is organized by questions um so there's a few that are kind of like basic like how does the brain work how is the nervous system organized and things like that um but i would say most of the book is like much more specific and kind of, in, in my opinion more interesting questions like um, why can't I ever get that itch on my back? Why is there always room for dessert? And then the last section, um, there's a few questions that are about like diseases or um, like, you know, physical therapy, like they talk about Alzheimer's. Um, so I think this is a really great resource. The way they talked about the human brain versus different animal brains, I think did a good job of talking about the differences without like, like making assumptions about like how much smarter um, one animal is than another or how much smarter we are than other animals, you know, like that kind of thing. I thought the layout was good. Um, there's like, you know, pictures and like text box and diagrams and things like that. Um, and there's also a lot of little like mini biographies about different brain scientists, which I thought was cool. And there's also different like lab, um, like kind of simple in that they don't require a ton of prep or materials, um, lab experiments. Overall, I think the, the writing itself was very good, but there were multiple places where the way something was worded, I couldn't tell if it was just supposed to be like a fun or interesting way of saying it, or if the author was actually describing something that you know, literally happens with the brain or the nervous system. I give it four stars. I also finished Legacy, Women Poets of the Harlem Renaissance by Nikki Grimes. Um, so I first heard about Nikki Grimes. I like got introduced to her poetry from Alicia Prini Brown, I reader. Um, she features her a lot in her poetry videos, but this is the first time that I have read a whole collection she's done. And the way that this is structured, um, cause it is, it does say Women Poets of the Harlem Renaissance. So, there are a ton of like poems by um, black female poets from the Harlem Renaissance um, that are included in this book. And then what Nikki Grimes does is she does, um, they're called golden shovel poems. So she takes out um, a sentence or like a, like a series of, of words. And then she uses that to write her own, own poem where um, most of the text is from her, but then every line has to end with that word. She explains it in the book too. And I loved this. This is probably one of my new favorite poetry collections. Um, not probably. This is definitely one of my new favorite poetry collections. I don't think this one had any that like didn't work for me as well. Like I loved every single original poem. I loved every single poem that Nikki Grimes wrote. Um, there's also a lot of different illustrators and the art is absolutely stunning and in um, a lot of different styles. Like I just, I love this so much. But also, I think they would be really great even for people who are hesitant about poetry, like especially if you tend to struggle with poetry that's not like really contemporary. I just, I love this. I gave it five stars. Fantastic. These are not in the order that I read them, by the way, but I also read A Sitting in St. James by Rita Williams Garcia. Um, I read and loved the trilogy that she wrote, and this is the only other thing that I've read from her now, and this book like firmly puts her on my favorite authors list. So this is set in 1860 in Louisiana, and um, we are following multiple different points of view. Um, it's called a sitting in St. James because one of the big like incidents in the book is that Madame Sylvie, um, who is like she was originally French and she is kind of the matriarch um, 
of this like plantation. They have quite a few enslaved people um, and Madame Sylvie decides that she's going to sit for a portrait, um, that it's time that that's going to be her legacy and um, that actually doesn't happen until around the middle of the book and we also follow her like personal slave um, named Thisbe or that's what she calls her but that's not actually her name. Um, so we follow her point of view, we follow Madame Sylvie's son um, and grandson who's being expected to um, marry into this other wealthy French plantation family. Um, I'm saying French because they were originally from France. Louisiana is now an American um, territory or state. And we also get little bits of like other characters and other characters backstories um, throughout the book. And this is just an absolute masterpiece. Like this is one of the best constructed books that I feel like I've read. Like it is just like the writing, the writing quality itself is absolutely top notch. Like the way that Rita Williams Garcia just sets the tone and the stage and the atmosphere and like her writing just feels so rich but also effortless. Um, I think she does a fantastic job of characterization. Um, you know, some characters who you really love and connect to and feel for and some who are absolutely despicable. And I personally feel like the blend of point of views was really well done. Like I didn't feel like it was confusing or distracting. It's very clear-eyed about what life was like um, for the enslaved people on this plantation and like even the ones who had like privileges, you know, like that doesn't, that doesn't change anything about the fact that they are enslaved. There's no kind way to own other people, you know, and I think that this book really shows that in just by giving the black characters in this book the the like respect of this storytelling and um something that the author says in her author's note she talks about like not tasking the black characters in her story with proving themselves extraordinary or human like they are just allowed to be and to have their story i found this so incredibly gripping and engrossing like this is this is almost 500 pages but i just i flew through this like i was so invested i couldn't put it down and it is a very like character focused story. The story that she's telling is so compelling. Like I was always um, incredibly invested and interested in what was happening. So obviously <laughs> I gave a sitting in St. James five stars. I definitely think this is one of the highlights of this section so far. Okay and then the last one I have for this update is The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. Um, I am reading this as preparation for the book I actually have to read because the sequel is the one that was nominated um, or, or long listed or something. And this is the first book in a series and we are following a teenage girl named Avery who is really just barely scraping by. Like she's really really smart, she makes sure she does well in school, um, but her mother has died recently and she Avery really doesn't have a lot of money, um, so she has her life kind of meticulously planned out. Um, she's living with her half-sister Libby. Then she ends up getting a letter that says she has to be at Hawthorne House for the reading of the will of the patriarch of the family who just died recently. Um, and she shows up and it turns out he left her everything. This man who she never knew, never met, has no idea who he is, um, he just, he left his like billions of dollars and the estate and everything to her and um, with a stipulation that she has to live in the house for one year and that's gonna be really tricky when all of the other like family members who have just been cut out of the will are also living in that house. The man who died, uh, Tobias Hawthorne, also has four grandsons um, and so they are living at the house as well. There is Xander, Grayson, Jameson, and Nash and so of course there there is like a love triangle situation um, involving a couple of them. She starts thinking that there is some kind of like puzzle or riddle connected to it. This series has been, I think, pretty consistently buzzed about and I did not love it. Um, I was a little underwhelmed. Um, there were some parts I found very frustrating but there were parts I liked. Um, Avery's the main character I thought was likable, you know, she was fine. There were some kind of annoying things about her but I think that's due to the writing rather than the way that she is specifically characterized. I was also very thankful that pretty quickly the book uh, confirms that um, that Avery is not like secretly related to them or something. But thankfully no Cassandra Clare situation here. I really liked some of the supporting characters like Libby. Um, I liked Nash and um, just like the general, like I like that Avery does have people in her corner. As for like the main boys, like I said, I like Nash. He's the older one. Like the book was not setting him up as a romantic interest, thankfully. Um, Jameson and Grayson seem to be the ones who are 
being written that way. I did actually find the mystery elements interesting. I actually was really in invested in just like the family backstory, like finding out these like family secrets. One of the big misses for me though was the romantic like element. <sighs> Grayson I think has potential to be a more interesting character um, just because of the way that we see pretty early on that like he presents himself a certain way but there's like more to him than that. Um, so I think he, he has potential I think to be more interesting later on. I found Jameson so obnoxious like I could not stand him. He's my least favorite of the brothers because <laughs> he's just he's like so irritating but also so bland. It kind of reminds me of like the things that I was saying about like Will Herondale <laughs> in the Infernal Devices trilogy where like <sighs> I have liked character types like him before but this is just the most uninteresting version of that. Um, and the thing that made it even worse is like Avery having these like simultaneous feelings. Like I think that is like what really gets me about the love triangle thing. She has this like moment with Jameson where they, you know, they're, they're getting very close to each other and there's all this tension and her heart's beating so fast and she starts thinking all these dramatic things about how like handsome and charming and interesting and dangerous he is. And then like literally 10 minutes later she ends up in a room with Grayson and like the exact same thing happens and I just find, find that so ridiculous. I just don't think we get enough character work for either of these guys to make those scenes like seem anything but ridiculous. There's this weird thing that like about the writing of this book. I feel like there are details or like quirks. They're just kind of like shoved into the story at, for no reason. Like Xander, his his like personality trait is like robots like he's really good at inventing and scones and I'm like that is so random <laughs> and like not in an endearing way like I think it's supposed to be it just felt like I don't know it just kind of felt like Jennifer Lynn Barnes was like all right we're, we're up to like the third or fourth brother I'm running out of ideas I do really appreciate the short chapters though I love a book with short chapters anyway I've talked so much about this one but I think I'm gonna give it like a three stars I feel like I complained enough <laughs> that it maybe doesn't sound like a three stars but like I genuinely had a like pretty solid time with this one um and once I realized that I just wasn't gonna be here for the romance I think it got easier to like look past it. I am really hoping that Jameson is not endgame because I just find him so annoying like it's possible we could get some development for him like that has definitely happened to me before where we had that kind of like turnaround from a character that I didn't like but I don't know I'm, I'm not thinking Jameson's gonna be that. So I just finished This Book is Feminist, an intersectional primer for next-gen change makers by Jamia Wilson and illustrated by Aurelia Durand. Um, so here is an example of what the illustrations look like. And yeah, this is a nonfiction book and it's exactly what it says. It's kind of like a introduction to feminist basics, um, but I do think it goes beyond that. It covers a lot of important topics and, a and aspects of feminism. And one thing that I really love is the emphasis on like intersectionality and how uh, like uh, the author talks a lot about how there's no such thing as like a single issue fight. I feel like this maybe needed some more editing um, because there were like not just like oh there were typos here and there but if there were aspects of the writing that actually made this kind of confusing. Also she includes a lot of like personal memoir stuff and I don't feel like that was super well blended into the rest of the nonfiction which I have definitely read books that do that. The way that she would like introduce the memoir parts um, it really didn't feel like it matched like the tone or the kind of writing. Um, like it felt, okay, it felt weirdly like a job interview in some parts. And then also there were a lot of other parts of the writing that I think felt much denser than they maybe should have if this is meant to be an introductory text for like teenagers or high schoolers. So I don't know, I, I think this is doing a lot of important work, but I just think it could have been a lot more effective. Um, and then I also finished The Magical Imperfect by Chris Barron. This is a novel in verse, um, as you can see here, and it is set in... what year is it? Is it 89? I think 1989 is when it's set um, in like the, I think, San Francisco Bay Area, and we are following kind of two main characters, but we are only following one perspective, and that is Eitan. Um, and he is a young Jewish boy, and he is struggling right now because his mom has had to leave um, and go stay long term at like a care facility for some kind of like mental um, like mental health kind of program or treatment and we don't really know a lot of details about it um, but he's having a hard time and he and his dad both are really um, so he's kind of got like that 
family complication going on and also because of some other things that have happened it's also affected his like friendship um with this boy jordan and i feel like that was like very realistic and Etan is like a really wonderful kid and he's always like helping his neighbors and running errands for them and one day he ends up delivering a grocery order um to the house of a young girl named malia um who her and her family are from the philippines or like her uh like elder generations of her family are and so Etan and malia kind of bond over that because Etan's family um were jewish european immigrants and malia also has um a pretty severe like eczema condition and it means that kids at school are really mean to her about that like they really bully her about it and so she's kind of she stopped going to school and then there ends up being a talent show um that their school, that their school is doing and um Eitan is kind of trying to encourage her to join because she has an amazing singing voice. His grandfather tells him all these stories about this sacred and important clay that they brought on the banks of like different rivers when they left Europe. Um, he tells him stories about the golem and um, like this, this clay and what it can do and so um, Eitan kind of ends up getting this idea about you know maybe using some of that clay and maybe it can help um, like help Malia, like help her kind of health condition. I really loved Eitan and Malia and I really loved their friendship. Um, I really liked the cultural blending of this book and um, what it kind of says about like the old and the new coming together. I thought that was great. Um, this book also deals with uh, some like natural disaster type things. I thought the family relationships were very complex. I think that it is really important that like I don't read a lot of middle grade books where a one of the kids is dealing with a parent being absent and it's the kind of absence in this book you know i really enjoyed the writing style as well um and i gave the magical imperfect four stars and then i also read last night at the telegraph club by melinda lowe um and we are following our main character lily who who is um chinese american and this is like set in the 1950s so it's like during the red scare but it's after like the chinese exclusion act was like loosened in the u.s um so there is more immigration here this is also set actually um in like the san francisco uh in San Francisco itself and so because of the Red Scare and like the McCarthyism and everything um, there are a lot of things that it is especially unsafe to be right now including like you know Chinese um, or Chinese American and also um, being a lesbian and Lily has been kind of like having these questions and realizations for years now about how she feels. She ends up making friends with this girl in her, cl in her class named Kath um, and Kath ends up taking her on and on Lily's request to this place called the Telegraph Club, which is a lesbian bar. Um, it's one of the only places that it's like, you know, safe to be yourself if you are a queer woman. And then the friendship between Kath and Lily ends up, you know, developing into something else. Um, but of course there is a lot at stake here. And I loved this. Like I thought this was such a beautiful story. Um, I love the writing. Like, I feel like I should check out other things by Melinda Lowe because I just really love the way that she writes. Um, like, the way that she, like, sets the stage with, like, the setting and everything but doesn't overdo it. And then I love the way that she writes characters and there's some, like, just really wonderful lines without getting bogged down in like description and everything um so I, I love the writing style itself I felt for Lily so so much like I just really was invested in her I really cared about her and loved her um and I just I was so wrapped up in following her journey of like acceptance and love um and I also really loved Kath like the the romance in this book is like honestly one of my favorites I've read recently I just thought it was so like beautiful and tender and supportive and like exciting like, it was just it was lovely i loved them together and separately as well um and i also think that the family relationships and friendships were really really complex and interesting and this is another book where i did not expect to get like actual perspective chapters from you know like lily's parents or from one of her aunts um like i just thought that was a really unexpected touch but i thought it was really really cool i think that really com contributed to making this story and these characters feel really like fleshed out. I thought the themes were beautiful. Um, I thought the historical aspects were really well done. This is one where like I think even people who are a harder sell on historical fiction I feel like you might still get on with this one. Um, I thought this was really really beautiful. Um, again my one tiny issue relates to the ending um, and specifically for this book I, I think that we really did need more like some kind of answer for how 
certain characters were doing, especially because of the way that they were written earlier and because we spent so much time with them. But other than that, I thought this was beautiful. I gave last night at the Telegraph Club five stars. Call Me Athena, Girl from Detroit by Colby Cedar Smith. This is a very chonky um, novel in verse and we are following our main character, Mary, although this is another one where we do get perspectives from like other characters, other family members, which I thought was interesting. Um, but the majority of the story is following Mary and it's in the 1930s Detroit, um, which apparently I can really enjoy big city settings when it's historical fiction, <laughs> um, which is, you know, a good thing to learn about my reading taste. Um, but yeah, and she is the daughter of French and Greek immigrants. Um, this is also based very heavily on the author's own family and like family stories and everything and family history. Um, and so our main character of course is Athena and it's about her dealing with the like very heavy family expectations on her. And I thought this was very well done. Um, it's not my favorite novel in first. I do read a decent number of those. Um, so maybe I'm a little pickier about them, but I did think that um, the writing and the like overall storytelling was good. It's definitely like a, a no frills kind of writing style in terms of the the poetry or the verse, um, which is not a bad thing, but um, I do think it did a good job of like, conveying the emotion and the characters. I thought it did pretty well. Um, I thought the historical setting was very interesting. I once again thought it was very interesting that we get um, perspectives from other characters and I think that that helps them feel more well-rounded. I thought Athena was a likable character. I did like enjoy following her. I just think that her characterization combined with the kind of straightforwardness of the poetry, I think sometimes she felt a little bit flatter than other like novels and verse protagonists, you know? Because um, one thing I think that a novel and verse can do really well is be a character study or like focus a lot on emotion and characterization and this one didn't quite do that for me. Um, but I also like the portrayal of grief in this book I actually thought was incredibly effective. Um, I was not expecting it to to deal, deal with that so much. But I thought the romance was fine. Um, I actually I like that the love interest was such a like genuinely nice person. <laughs> I also really liked the like social issue focus of this book. Um, like we see that in a few different ways and that was another one of the things that I thought was like really well done in this book and that I also think made Athena a more compelling character. Like there's one scene in particular involving um, a baby who was abandoned and like the way that Athena has this this like realization of like when she sees like this woman helping like that she wants to do that like i love how how that happens i love how that turns into her getting pulled into all this other stuff going on and i gave call me athena four stars and this one is kind of an exciting one to talk about because this is another one that was a huge surprise for me um like i think i mentioned in another clip that there was one or two books where I, I don't think I would have picked it up if not for this project and this is one of those and I'm this is like one of the reasons that I think it's so cool to do projects like this because um, I'm talking about Fallout by Steve Scheinkin and let me look up the audiobook narrator because I did listen to this one on audio. Okay I think the narrator was Roy Samuelson so the full title is Fallout, Spies, Super Bombs, and the Ultimate Cold War Showdown. Um, so this is a nonfiction book and I do not like Cold War history is not something I'm specifically interested in. I never would have picked this up by myself. I don't read fiction about this era. I don't read nonfiction about this era. Um, but I loved this. I thought this was so good. So as I said, I listened to the audio, which I think was really well done. Um, I feel like the narration fit. It, it had like the right amount of like performativeness for a nonfiction because like we are, it is told in like a really compelling like narrative kind of way, but it also I think did a good job of conveying like the factual information and I feel like the audiobook matched that. Um, so yeah, this is about the Cold War um, between the US and the USSR and a little bit about the space race, but a big part of it is about um, not just the Cuban Missile Crisis, but like the lead up to that and like the um, like the atomic bomb and like where like how that began um, like the development of that of course the US dropped two of those bombs on Japan during World War II and that kind of kicked off this um, this era of you know like nuclear weaponry and um, I thought this was so well done really really compelling um, like it really does read like a a suspenseful like fiction book even though like you know how things turn out obviously because it's history um for one thing it is terrifying how close 
the Cuban Missile Crisis was. Like, I just, I don't even like thinking about that. I, like, I learned a lot from it. Like, we did study this time period in school, but, like, the way that it's told in this book, I think, is so much clearer and more interesting and more cohesive. Uh, like, I feel like I would have learned a lot more in in my class about it if it had been told more like this book. Um, I think it did a good job of, uh, like, of portraying the, like, different historical figures um, in a way that is interesting without, like, I don't know, almost, like, over-characterizing them. I got a better appreciation for some of these figures that I did know about, but I didn't know a lot about. Um, I learned about a lot of people, especially, like, a lot of activists during this period, and also, um, this book does deal with, like, the Berlin Wall as well, and, like, I really didn't know very much about the people who were, like, risking their lives over and over to free people and to reunite families. Like, I, I knew that was happening, but I didn't know a lot of specifics. I also think the, like, espionage aspects were very interesting, and, um, just, like, the history in general, and, um, yeah, I just thought this was great. I was really enjoying the book throughout, but what really elevated this book to a five stars for me was right at the very end, the author includes a very short note about, like, his intentions with this book and why it is a subject that he writes about and that he has strong feelings about and that he thinks it's important to know about and that I just I, I really liked that we got that I'm really glad that that was included in the audiobook as well hello everybody I am finally back with the last few book ep updates so I'm gonna start off with a few picture books I read and I also apologize if I am looking down at my phone um, I'll be reading some authors names off that so I read Nina by Tracy N Todd this is a biographical picture book about Nina Simone um, and it obviously talks about her music talent um, but it also has a real emphasis on her uh, fight in the civil rights movement which I really appreciated I feel like it's only more recently that I have been seeing that be emphasized just as much as her music now granted I'm not like an expert on Nina Simone or anything I haven't read a ton of things about her life um, but I do feel like we're starting to see more um, discussion of that because that was a hugely important part of her work. I thought it was written well, I thought the art was really bright and beautiful, so five stars for that one. I read Unspeakable by Carol Boston Weatherford. Um, illustrator will be in the captions and this is about the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, so this is a nonfiction picture book as well and I thought this one was fantastic as well. Like I feel like I read a lot of really great picture books during this project. Um, yeah, I thought the, the art was really evocative and I thought it did a great job of telling the true story of how Black Wall Street was destroyed and how so many people were killed um, or forced out of their homes and I think it did all of this in a way that was very honest um, while also taking into account that this is a picture book for children. I also read One Be Too Many by Andre P. Andrew. Um, this one is like a parable or a metaphor or something um, because it's about a bunch of bees in a hive and they suddenly find out that there is one bee too many, um, that they don't have enough room for everybody and so they need to like kick out one of the bees. Um, and it's a story with a message about acceptance and welcoming people um, into your community. I just don't feel like this one was as effective as a lot of the other picture books I've read. Um, like the, the core message is very important and I very much agree with it, but I just feel like the way that was translated into the story, it, I don't know, it was like heavy handed, but also like weirdly non-specific i don't know so i didn't love that one but i do think it's a really important one and i read we all play by julie flett julie flett is a native author i believe she's first nations from canada um and this is a really lovely very simple picture book about um talking about like the different animals that these young children see playing and it's about how you know animals play and so do uh human children i really love julie flett um as an illustrator and as a storyteller and then one that i have that is not really a picture book but it's i don't know it's one of those like dk kids books so it's like longer than a picture book but there are a lot of pictures and graphics and it's nonfiction. Um, and the one I read was Timelines from Black History and that is exactly what it is. It focuses on black history. There is a lot of emphasis on African Americans but it does include um, Africa, like the continent as well, and a lot of the countries and kingdoms. A lot of these are like biographical timelines um, that are ordered in the book you know, starting from like prehistory and then going through um, like different African kingdoms and then like colonization and slavery and then a lot of like um, 
like u different US time periods, so like the Civil War, Jim Crow, and um, the Civil Rights Movement, and that kind of thing. Um, and you are getting a lot of different biographies of like really amazing black people from a wide range of backgrounds and in a wide range of fields. And I thought this was really fantastic. Um, this is another one that I wouldn't have even heard about if not for this project. I thought this was such a good way to convey all of this information in an interesting way. The only thing I will say is I don't recommend reading it on ebook if you have the option not to. Um, I ended up having to do that because I wasn't able to get my library copy in time. And so there was a lot of like me having to zoom in and out on the captions and everything but the actual layout was fantastic. I'll put some pictures up. This is another book that I think did a really excellent job of threading that needle between not sugarcoating history and in fact in a lot of cases like myth busting some things that you know might have been taught in schools um, while also keeping it like in appropriate language I feel like for the kids reading it. I think it was a little bit of a weird choice to start off the book. So like they have like the section on prehistory which makes sense. They talk about how you know, all human beings are descended from people who lived in Africa, which is true and I think is very important to include, and I totally get why they did. But they start like all the way back with like Australopithecus in like around that era, so like they basically, and even before that actually a little bit, so like they're talking about like apes, and that's like the first like the first thing that you read when you start reading this book, and I just felt like that was a little bit odd because there was no no real like context provided. You know that has been something that racists compare black people to, um, like historically that has been something they do and people still do that. Um, and I just found it a little odd. I'm not saying they shouldn't have put that part in but I just feel like they could have included a little bit of like background. And as somebody who I've always like struggled with timelines as a way of like learning information, like you know when I was in school I had a really hard time with that. There was just something about that structure that was very difficult for me to remember, but this book was so easy to follow. I feel like it did a great job of laying it out in a way that was very clear and interesting. So um, yeah, I give this one five stars. I thought it was great. The Last Quintista by Dona Barba Iguera. This was a present from my friend Yvette as well. Um, so I finally got to it and I absolutely see why it has been doing so well with different awards because this is very very powerful, very well written. We are following our main character Petra Pena um, and this is set in the future where um, the earth is going to be destroyed by a comet um, or like an asteroid and um, Petra and her family, like her parents and her younger brother, they are one of the very few families who are chosen to be rescued, like to be taken off the planet. Like the opening scene is Petra having to say goodbye to her grandmother on earth um, and knowing that she's never gonna see her again and that um, like the, the world is gonna be destroyed, all of these people are gonna die. So um, it's a very very heavy book. I feel like anybody who doesn't think middle grade books ever have anything bad happen in them, I like, I don't know, I feel like this book is a good uh, counter example to that. So they're all going to be put in stasis and they have to travel like several hundred years to get to this other planet as an alternative to Earth. Um, but something goes wrong because um, Petra wakes up, but things have gone very very wrong. There are these people who have taken over the ship um, and the whole like project and exploration um, called the Collective who are forcing everybody to be the same and who have removed completely all memories of Earth and of stories and of histories and all of that. Um, their argument is that like they can start anew, they can start fresh, that they shouldn't, um, like the, the answer to solving all of these problems is by forgetting everything that happened. And so Petra finds that she is the only person on this ship who does remember anything. Um, and she has grown up wanting to be a storyteller and so she has to use those skills to try and keep any kind of hope alive that she can um, that she can stop the collective, that she can find other people and get other people to remember Earth and um, yeah this was incredibly emotional. I love Petra so 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 much. Like sh her as the protagonist is definitely one of my favorite parts of this book because I love her compassion and her determination and her kindness and her love and like her dedication to stories and um, making sure that people's stories are remembered and told. Um, I just thought that was really really beautiful and that fit in really well with the themes of this book which are of course about the importance of stories and of history and memory. Like the way this book deals with all of that was 
it just heartbreaking but also heart filling um like there are definitely some hopeful parts as well um in this book but it's a lot like petra just she goes through so so much and i feel like this book is a lot about like the resilience of the human spirit um although of course she shouldn't have to be resilient in these circumstances but, like the themes of sacrifice and of love and what love is i also thought the family relationships and like the characterization of all of that um was really wonderful and again going back to how much i love petra i love so much that she is somebody who is not willing to leave people behind um like she recognizes that that is one of the things that she is fighting for and so for her to try to escape by herself would be meaningless and i just adore her so so much like uh, yeah i love petra i was also very impressed with like her um like her reasoning and her like dis decision making and her intelligence um i don't know like the way that i feel like she navigated these like horribly scary and dangerous situations i thought was like very impressive and from like a writing perspective i feel like that's a great example of how like you don't have to just have characters make dumb choices to move the plot along you know um so yeah anyway i thought this was incredible like everybody else uh i gave the last quintista five stars i'm glad i finally read it um and also it was surprisingly short and like quick to read and also surprisingly compact in a way like it's a very expansive story in terms of the themes and um the fact that it is you know traveling to another planet but um it's also a very intimate and human story and i think that is deliberate and i think that was a beautiful aspect of the book as well and then finally i think the last book i have for this whole project um is the hawthorne legacy by jennifer lynn bonds i know my copy does not match book one that was not intentional i ordered a matching copy and that's not what i got but it's okay so this is the sequel to the inheritance games um which like this second book is actually the one that was um nominated for like one of the prizes um so i had to read the first book in, in preparation and i liked this even less than the first book i really really didn't like this and it's making me want to like retroactively downgrade my rating of the first book because i feel like all of my problems with the first book are here but like way worse um yeah i'm not gonna get into the synopsis because that would spoil a lot of things but there's still mystery there's still family secrets we're still trying to figure out what's going on with this inheritance and there's still a bunch of messy like love dynamics and character relationships and i just found this a very very frustrating reading experience um once again, I'm very grateful for the short chapters because this would have been really hard to slog through for me um, if it had longer chapters. I just, I find Jameson to be absolutely insufferable. Like, I cannot stand him. I hate every time he's on page. He is the most obnoxious nothing of a character. I don't understand how you can have a character be in the book so much and yet have absolutely no personality. I obviously hated the romance angle in this, which is a big chunk of the book. Um, Avery, as a main character, like, I don't dislike her, but she makes, she makes some decisions where I'm like, girl, like, you are really smart. Like, she is very intelligent. We know this. We see evidence of this. But then when it comes to, like, big decisions, I it feels like jennifer lynn barnes is just making her do the dumb thing so that she can move us to the next plot point the mystery and the twists like so many of them in this book like okay there were one or two that were good or interesting or that did surprise me and the mystery itself is one of the only things that i did enjoy about this book but <laughs> a lot of the rest of the mystery stuff is just so ridiculous like completely like over the top soap opera and then also confusing i'm like i i can't even remember like who this person is because like we think we know who they are and then we find out they're not and then we find out they are and then we find out something else and it's like i think this is supposed to be shocking but i literally can't even remember who you're related to anymore um so it just wasn't as effective there's this one character that like we hear a lot about like i am so sick of emily like she's not even she's not even on page and yet she is so present in this book and not in like an interesting way like rebecca by daphne du maurier like it's just obnoxious like we are told over and over about how like interesting she is i think jennifer lynn barnes keeps just telling us 
how we're supposed to react to things rather than like actually writing them in a way that gives that reaction like she does this with the with the characters like all the time like that's what i was saying about jameson and the really really lackluster romantic angle like we're just fed line after line after line after line about how like charming and interesting and handsome and smart and like all these different things that he is also i just have to say that avery's security team I feel like they should be fired like this is the worst like personal security plan or whatever that I have ever read about like I just it's so weird and I understand that a certain amount of that makes sense because like if you didn't have dangerous things happen like you wouldn't have a book <laughs> but just the contrast between like how competent some of these people seem when they're talking to Avery and then like the number of times that they have this huge security breach I, I, I don't know it's just it's kind of silly like it got to the point where I'm like are you kidding me like what you literally have one job how are you so bad at this um I mean part of that is like Avery's decision making but like not all of it a lot of it should be on them so I guess like the bad decision making is not just Avery like there's like a lot of characters where I'm like why would you do this like why would you believe this person why would you say this to this person like a lot of times we just weren't given motivation like of any kind and also this is something that I feel about both of the books in the series but um I know the whole premise is that she like inherits this like absolutely ridiculous amount of money but especially reading this in the year 2023 um it just doesn't I don't know I don't feel like it hits right <laughs> uh like the Tobias Hawthorne the older man who died um he had a truly disgusting amount of money like an unimaginable amount of money basically and um it's just I don't feel like we're discussing how unethical that is in the book and I don't necessarily mean like how he made the money although that could be part of it as well and we do get kind of a reference in this book that um, we're maybe going to find out some more sketchy things about where that money came from so maybe this is dealt with more in later books but in terms of the actual like you are sitting on so much money that could like I'm not even exaggerating it could like end world hunger you know and he hasn't done that <laughs> Um, and I, I'm sure like Avery has a lot going on right now so maybe she's gonna get around to that we do see that she is gonna be working with like the charity foundation that the Hawthorne family is attached to um, so maybe that's coming later but it just it feels icky and the like taking like having like seven different private jets you know and and taking these flights at the drop of a hat because you have to go find a clue somewhere like these are just things that I think translate less and less well uh to the world that we're living in right now i mean in my opinion but the writing like the writing is not bad exactly you know when you're watching like a crime show and they have that like punchy dramatic one-liner right before the commercial break and there's usually like a dun dun like music cue it can often feel very like cheesy or a little silly but like it's not that big a deal like you know it's one line you get over it whatever <laughs> It's like that, but she does this at like the end of every single chapter and also like three or four times throughout the chapter. And I think that's one of the reasons why the romance felt so dumb to me. So it would be like the fake drama that was annoying, but also like the way that, again, we were being told things that we hadn't really seen for ourselves. Like, um, Jameson had a habit of tossing out words that should matter like they didn't at all and it's like does he does he have that habit I don't feel like we've seen much from him the cute nickname that he gives Avery like he almost never uses her name and I just don't find that cute in general but also his nickname for her is Eris and that the way that's always written is like it's this like really charming romantic like oh what a bad boy how cute and I'm like that's not like the, okay that's that's technically a nickname but it's just a it's just a literal description of her role in the book like it's not clever it's not cute it's not funny it's not romantic i give this two stars i will definitely not be continuing the series but i might read spoilers for the last book whenever that comes out so the kind of highlights of this like i read a lot of really wonderful books but i tried to really contain uh my list of favorites here a Sitting in St. James by Rita Williams Garcia, Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe, Himawari House by Harmony Becker, Legacy by Nikki Grimes, Fallout by Steve Scheinkin, Timelines from Black History by DK, 
Honestly Elliot by Gillian McDunn and Hummingbird by Natalie Lloyd. I feel like that is a good representation of some of my biggest hits, some of my biggest surprises. Like several of these, as I said, are ones that I hadn't even heard of before this project, so I thought that was great. And then in terms of the misses for me, um, I'm not really counting how you grow wings because again, that's not like the DNF is not a reflection on like the quality of the book or anything. Um, so the only real misses that I feel like I had is The Words We Keep by Aaron Stewart, I think is the author. Um, and obviously the uh, Hawthorne Legacy series. So that's a really, really good hit rate. I'm not really surprised that these seem to be much higher quality books than the ones I read for the Goodreads uh, middle grade category. Um, I feel like there was a lot more care that went into selecting these books and I also feel like even for the ones that I didn't like as much, I can understand why they ended up on this list. So I think kind of one of the messages here is like seek out smaller awards in general. Um, like I'm not, you know, nothing against like the Newbery, for example, um, and several of these books did actually win or were nominated for the Newbery, but in terms of getting a really great range of really quality books that are, um, I don't know, they're, they're ones that you don't always hear about other places. So I think this was definitely a much more successful round of reading for me than either of the previous collabs. Uh, don't forget to check out everybody else's video. I'm sure mine is going to be one of the longest, if not the longest. But I hope you enjoyed this feature-length film. Um, please comment and let me know if you have read any of these, if you had thoughts on them. Um, let me know if you're excited to pick up any of these because I'm obviously very excited about a lot of these. Um, I, I loved so many of these books. I had so many five stars, so many four stars, um, and it's just very exciting to me that I had a few favorites that I would not have heard of if not, if not for this project. Um, and also let me know a kind of smaller book award um, that you enjoy or that you're interested in trying. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!